I am going to go ahead and get started. Uh, I want to thank everybody for joining me this morning. What I'd like to try to do during this talk is to um, give you a sense of really what um, we know about small fiber neuropathy and uh, how it relates to different types of chronic pain states that uh, patients may be experiencing. So we'll start off with a little neuroanatomy uh, and make sure that people are all kind of on the same page. So when we talk about nerves, uh, nerves are actually made up of two parts. And so if you look at the right side of the screen with these little yellow diagrams, what you see is a red circle. And that's actually the nerve or, or what we call the axon. And that's the wire uh, that supplies the information and conducts the electrical impulse down to the different parts of the body. The yellow substance around the, the axon is called the myelin, and that's the insulation of the nerve. So each individual nerve that we have is made up of one wire and then the amount of myelin that's wrapped around it. When we talk about a nerve, for example, like the sciatic nerve, and you look over on the left side, what you see is that a nerve like the sciatic nerve is actually made up of hundreds or thousands of individual axons. And these are arranged into different structures. So you see these bigger circles like telephone cables. In those telephone cables will be hundreds or thousands of nerves. And in a big nerve like the sciatic nerve, you may have several dozen, if not hundreds, of those individual fascicles. And then those nerves are all combined into one bigger cable. So basically you've got small wires combined into bigger groups, combined into bigger groups. And so the nerves convey different types of information based on the size of the nerve. So there's a very strict um, differential. Uh, and so if you look at our biggest nerves, what we call the A-alpha nerves, you can see that these are about 20 micrometers big. And then you can look at the conduction velocity, which is how fast the nerve conducts electricity. And what dictates how fast the nerve conducts electricity is how much myelin is wrapped around the nerve. So the actual axon doesn't change the speed with which it conducts electricity. But the more of that insulation that's wrapped around it, the faster the nerve conducts electricity. So these very big nerves, the A-alpha nerves, conduct, let's say, at about 100 meters per second, and they control what we call proprioception. And so that's when we walk, we have to know where our foot is very quickly in order to know where to put our next foot. And that's what we call proprioception, or as a patient, we perceive that as balance. Our medium nerves control the sensation of touch, so just whether you're touched, whether you've got clothes on, those types of sensations. And our very small nerves, um, which you can see may only be one micrometer, uh, conduct very, very slowly. So if your biggest nerves conduct at 100 meters per second, your very small nerves may conduct at one meter per second, so about 100 times slower. And these small nerves, the A delta and the C fibers, have very little myelin wrapped around them, and they control information about pain. So any sensation that you feel about pain is being conveyed on these very little small uh, nerve fibers. Um, and, and that's true throughout all of our body and throughout different uh, species as well. So when we talk about peripheral neuropathies, um, most of these are what we call mixed fiber. So if you think about diabetes damaging the nerves, it's going to damage the little nerves, the medium nerves, the big nerves, all roughly the same. If you think about chemotherapy, most of the time it's going to damage all of those nerves the same. But in some cases, um, the neuropathy can start and only damage the small nerve fibers. And in some cases, then, it will stay confined only to the small nerve fibers. And in other cases, as it progresses and gets worse, um, it may then start to involve the, the, the larger fibers, and then we call that a mixed fiber neuropathy. So people can have mixed fiber neuropathies, or they can have pure small fiber neuropathies. If you have a small fiber neuropathy, the symptoms that you get um, are related to damage to the small nerves. And because the small nerves convey information about pain, the symptoms that you experience are due to pain. 
So numbness and tingling uh, is very common. Um, the small nerve fibers have recently been shown to be present in the muscle. So muscle cramps and muscle pain uh, are very common with small fiber neuropathy. They don't cause true muscle weakness because the nerve fibers that control movement are not necessarily affected. But many people may feel weak because their muscles are cramped or their muscles are in pain. The most common symptom is nerve pain. And, and, and nerve pain typically presents as a burning type pain, a stabbing pain, a shooting pain, uh, prickly. Um, and the symptoms are usually persistent, but they can come and go, and they can actually be in different parts of your body as well. So what we're taught as doctors is that most neuropathies are what we call length dependent and usually symmetrical. And so what that means is that when we talk about the mixed fiber neuropathies and when doctors think about what, what symptoms people have from neuropathy, they think about numb toes and burning feet. Um, but small fiber neuropathy sort of breaks those rules. So small fiber neuropathy may be asymmetrical, meaning it may be on one side of your body and not the other, and it may be non-length dependent, which means I've seen patients with small fiber neuropathy with terrible chest pain or back pain and no leg pain um, or even facial pain um, can all be symptoms of small fiber neuropathy. The other problem, and what's led to the difficulty with physicians making this diagnosis, is that there are typical tests that we do um, and have done for decades to confirm whether a patient has neuropathy. Um, and so one of those is that we examine your sensation, and, and the sensation that we tend to examine the most consistently is either vibration or proprioception. But remember that we said that vibration and proprioception are conveyed on our big nerve fibers. So if you test the big nerve fibers and those nerve fibers work correctly, it doesn't tell you what's happening with the small nerve fibers. In addition, we use our reflexes so that most patients with uh, neuropathy have decreased reflexes. But with small fiber neuropathy, the reflexes can be normal. Um, and then finally, the sort of what has been traditionally the gold standard test to look for something wrong with the nerves or what we call nerve conduction studies or an EMG. Um, and that's a very sensitive test, but the problem is that because the small nerve fibers convey information so slowly, they can't be detected by nerve conduction studies or by EMG. So all of the tests that we traditionally use as doctors, meaning the sensory exam, the reflexes, and the nerve conduction studies, can all be normal in patients that have pure small fiber neuropathies. And so doctors traditionally have looked at patients who've come in and said, I have this type of nerve pain. The doctors do all of the tests and they don't find anything wrong. And the patients are very frequently labeled as being kind of crazy um, because there's no way to explain their pain. So over the last really 20 years, um, people have begun to try to look at tests to try to diagnose pure small fiber neuropathies. So one test that's available is a conventional nerve biopsy, where we typically take a piece of nerve out from the ankle. Um, this is a very invasive test. It leaves the half uh, of your foot numb for the rest of your life because we remove the nerve. And again, if you think about that picture, what we're really looking at is the whole nerve. And it's very difficult sometimes to see those small nerves. So it's a very useful test if you're concerned about mixed fiber neuropathies. It's not really as useful if you're concerned about small fiber neuropathies. Uh, there's a type of testing called quantitative sensory testing, um, which has been used and um, is not widely available, but it's very subjective. So it relies on a patient telling us whether or not they can feel uh, for us to know whether there's something wrong. And then some patients will get autonomic testing, uh, a test called QSART, um, to look at the way that their sweating uh, works. And the reason for that is that these small nerve fibers um, also control our sweat glands. And so if you've got problem with the small nerve fibers, then sometimes you can see that on the QSART. But all of these are really indirect tests of looking for the small nerve fibers. And again, this is just to give you an idea of the difference in speed of the different nerves. So if you look at those A beta nerve fibers, our fastest nerve fibers, those work about 250 miles an hour, so at least a a very fast car or a very slow airplane speed. 
if you look at our C nerve fibers, they work at about one to two miles per hour. And this is why we can't detect them on exam or on the nerve conduction studies. So what's evolved over the last 10 to 15 years is a way to directly look at the small nerve fibers. And these nerve fibers are actually in our skin, which makes them very easily accessible and, and easy to biopsy. So just like if you have a problem with your kidney or your lungs, the doctors may at some point say, hey, we need to look at the kidney or the lungs to see what's wrong. Neurologists feel the same way, which is if you have a problem with your nerves, we need to know if that's what the problem is and we need to know what's going on. And so that's done through a skin biopsy. Um, this is just like what the dermatologists do. So unlike the uh, traditional nerve biopsy, which leaves your foot numb for the rest of your life, there's really no long-term uh, side effect of this. There are uh, small three uh, millimeter sites, sorry, not centimeter sites. So very, very small, about the size of a pencil eraser. Um, we give a little small lidocaine injection, which does burn for a few seconds, and then we take the punch biopsy. Uh, we don't use any stitches. Um, usually a couple months later, um, you can hardly even see it. Um, at worst, there's a small little scar. This can be done by any clinician, the actual biopsy itself. Um, so in my practice, I do them. Uh, actually, our RN does them. Um, primary care physicians can do them, pain doctors, rheumatologists. It, it, it takes about 10 minutes. Um, but the processing of the biopsy um, can only be done in, in a handful or maybe a dozen labs across the country. Um, and so if it's sent to a regular pathology lab, this technique can't be done. Um, and the reason for that is that it requires multiple, multiple steps. Uh, in order to be able to read these small little nerve fibers. And uh, routine pathology these days is primarily done in an automated machine. Uh, this has to be done all by hand and takes about five days of processing for each biopsy specimen. Um, then the specimen has to be read, um, and uh, uh, we believe that it needs to be read both by a neuropathologist who can look at the nerves as well as a dermatopathologist that can look at the skin because in some cases the skin may actually have a disease that's causing the problem and it may not actually be the nerves. So this is what the biopsy looks like. It's just a little core piece of skin. That blue stain at the top is the epidermis and that's where the small little nerve fibers um, are, are located. And so it goes through these multiple steps of being fixed and then frozen and then washed and then fixed again and then stained and then washed. Um, and again, each of these can each of these steps can take from a few hours to 24 hours. And so the entire process takes about five days. Um, so it is a very labor intensive process. And, and this is what the biopsy looks like. So first of all, um, I think it's important to make the point that this technique was developed by a number of major institutions, um, Johns Hopkins and the University of Minnesota, probably two of the most important in pioneering this work. Um, there are now thousands of articles uh, in the medical literature that talk about its reproducibility. It's been reviewed by the American Academy of Neurology. Um, this is an incredibly well accepted technique. Um, and if you look at the slide on the left here, you can see that there's this darker pink, pink substance, um, and this is the fat underneath your skin. And then there's this uh, kind of darker uh, purple substance, which is the epidermis, which is the most superficial layer of the skin. And then using the special antibody staining that we have, you can see these big arrows that show the small little nerve fibers. And each of these is one single nerve fiber. And, and what we do is we count the number of nerve fibers per millimeter of skin. And so each of us is supposed to have a normal number of nerve fibers. If you have a disease process, which is damaging those nerve fibers, then those nerve fibers will start to die and you'll have fewer nerve fibers. So again, here's a slightly different color stain, but again, you can see these long thin nerves that come from the lower level of the skin up to the epidermis that supply the sensation on your skin. And so what you can imagine is if these nerves are sick and you were to touch the skin, um, they may fire incorrectly. And if those nerves fire incorrectly, they're going to feel like pain or burning or stabbing. Um, one of my analogies is that if you imagine a, a, an outlet um, that you would plug a light socket into, for example, 
if those nerve fibers are frayed at the end, then they're going to spark. Um, and when those nerves spark, it gives off pain. So some people have pain in response to being touched, uh, a word that we call allodynia. And then some people have spontaneous pain. So you're just sitting in bed and all of a sudden it feels like an ice pick went through your toe or your muscle cramped or whatever. And that's because these nerves are sick and they're giving off abnormal discharges. Um, again, here's a nice normal nerve biopsy and you can see all the little uh, individual lines that go up into the surface of the skin supplying sensation. And then if you look um, at an abnormal one, you would see a reduced density. And so what we do is we define basically uh, an average based on um, your age, your gender, and, and then we consider anything in the 95th percentile uh, to be uh, abnormal. So if you're below that 95th percentile, um, then there's a problem with the nerves. Sometimes on the nerve biopsies, we can actually see these neuronal swellings, which is where, again, those nerves are supposed to be long, linear lines. You can see how swollen these nerve fibers are, and um, this means that these nerves are sick. And probably if you looked back in a few months, then, then these nerves will have died. So we biopsy a number of different sites. Um, typically, we biopsy the uh, calf right above the ankle. Um, uh, the distal thigh right around your knee, and then the proximal thigh around your hip. If you have pain in an area that's not one of those, um, then we might biopsy an area where you have the pain, so an arm, a chest, a back. Um, you can pretty much biopsy most places on your body. And so here's an example of a patient that has terrible pain on the left side of her back, um, but no pain on the right side of her back. And so if you take a biopsy from the right side of her back, you can see that there are these nice nerve fibers that supply the surface of her skin, but when you biopsy the left side of her back, you can see that there's no nerve fibers. And this leads to a little confusion with patients because often patients will say, well, if the nerves are dead, um, then why, why aren't I just numb? Why do I have pain? Um, and again, if you look back at this bottom left one, the one labeled B, what you can see is that below the surface of the skin with these arrows, there's still the nerve fibers. So again, remember, think about the, the lamp outlet in the wall. The nerve fibers are still in the wall, but it's the ends of those nerve fibers that are frayed or dead. And so if they're not fully connected, they're going to give off abnormal discharges. And then those abnormal discharges get perceived as pain. So you need the nerves to be in continuity and to be connected, and you need them to be functioning correctly in order not to have this spontaneous pain. So why do we care? Well, the reason that we care whether a patient has neuropathy um, is, is mainly um, to see whether we can do something to fix that neuropathy. So any patient can come in and say, I have pain and I can give you OxyContin and presumably the pain will get some better. But really, as a neurologist, our goal is to see if we can figure out what's causing that neuropathy. So the first step in a very logical progression, and neurologists like to think that we're logical, is to say, do I have a problem with the nerves? If there's a problem with the nerves, can I figure out what's causing that problem? And then is there a way to treat it? Many times there may not be an answer. And so about half of the time we can't figure out a cause, and we call that idiopathic neuropathy. If it's an idiopathic neuropathy, then we simply have to treat the, the symptoms and make the pain better but half of the time we can figure out a cause. And so these are the types of diseases that cause small fiber neuropathy. So probably the most common is diabetes um, or impaired glucose tolerance or kind of pre-diabetes. But there's a number of autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome or lupus or mixed connective tissue diseases. There are diseases that have specific antibodies against nerve that we call immune mediated. Um, sarcoid is sort of another uh, autoimmune disease that can cause this. Um, vitamin deficiencies, celiac disease, particularly in patients that have gluten insensitivity or stomach issues. Um, it can be related to certain types of cancers, um, like with paraproteins and amyloid. There can be inherited diseases that we now know about. Um, many types of, of trauma, either from alcohol or chemotherapy or other drugs, um, like the fluoroquinolones or uh, trauma, um, and then HIV. So this is a huge list of, of blood tests that need to be done in patients that have small fiber neuropathy 
in order for us to figure out a cause. Most doctors, if they just think of you as being a general pain patient or as a fibromyalgia patient, are not going to do these tests. And therefore, uh, you may miss the opportunity to actually figure out what's causing the underlying pain. Um, these are just a bunch of articles really over the last few years to make the point that there's a tremendous amount of research being done in small fiber neuropathy now. Um, this was the first uh, genetic uh, discovery um, of a gene that led to a malfunction in these small fibers in patients that had widespread pain um, and really again no other symptoms. Um, and this is a defect in a sodium channel gene. And sodium channels seem to be very important in uh, triggering these nerves to fire. This was an article a few years ago from Harvard, from Dr. Oaklander, um, where she showed that a large percentage of patients that have been labeled as reflex sympathetic dystrophy or complex regional pain syndrome actually have damage to their small nerve fibers. And in red, I've kind of highlighted her words where she says, again, small fiber lesions are easily missed and are not detected by standard electrophysiological testing. So many patients that have been told they have RSD or told that they have CRPS have nothing objective to point to. They can't say this is really what's wrong with me. Um, but by looking at these small nerve fibers, we may be able to show that there is actually nerve damage in those patients. Um, probably the most interesting um, discovery in the last two years has been the fact that chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia uh, in a large percentage of patients actually have damage to their small nerve fibers. Uh, so we, we did a study with the Ohio State, Dr. Oaklander at Harvard did a study, there was a study done in Europe, um, but it, uh, conservatively 40 to 50 percent of patients um, with fibromyalgia uh, actually have damage to their small nerve fibers. And, and the reason to me this is important is that um, fibromyalgia, like so many other diseases, is probably many diseases. And until we can kind of break them down into individual groups, um, we're not going to be able to be much smarter about finding better treatment options. So what this says to me is half of the fibromyalgia patients may actually have nerve damage. And we might think about those fibromyalgia patients as being different than the fibromyalgia patients that don't have nerve damage. In the study that we presented with Ohio State, in 70% of the fibromyalgia patients in whom there was no cause for their pain, we were able to find that there was a, a new diagnosis that explained their small fiber neuropathy if the biopsy was abnormal. Um, so again, about half had evidence of small fiber, and of that half, about 70% had a new diagnosis. So roughly in a third of patients that had no explanation for their pain, going through those tests that I showed you, we were able to find um, a explanation for why they have nerve damage and why they have pain. Um, this is a poster we presented at the American Academy of Neurology several years back. Um, and, and it makes two important points. Uh, I think one of the first points is, is if you look off to the right, it basically looks at what the clinical symptoms were and what the doctors, and these are, these are expert neuromuscular doctors, what the doctors thought the patient had, okay? And it really speaks to the following question, which is how smart are we as doctors? In other words, if I see a patient with pain, how good am I at knowing what the patient has? And, and what that study showed, which included some of my patients, was that a third of the time that I thought a patient had small fiber neuropathy, it wasn't small fiber neuropathy. Um, and so what that means is, at best, that makes me a C doctor. And, and I don't like to behave as a C doctor. So rather than just guessing and telling people that's what they have, we know that we can do the biopsy and we can figure out what they have. And again, this study looked at the fibromyalgia patients and found that 50% of the time doctors suspected that somebody had fibromyalgia, the problem was actually due to their small nerve fibers. And then the other point of that poster um, is that if you have an abnormal biopsy, then what that tells us is the generator of your pain is the nerves. And if the generator of the pain is your nerves and you have small fiber neuropathy, about 85% of the patients responded to the traditional nerve-type drugs, so gabapentin, Lyrica, Cymbalta, amitriptyline. 
if the biopsy was normal, then only 37% of the patients responded, and 37% is roughly placebo in any, pa in any pain study. So what that tells us is not only do we get smarter about what the patients have, but we may be able to be smarter about predicting what types of medications the patients are going to respond to. Um, the last little section I just want to touch on um, because it comes up a lot on these websites is um, can we treat small fiber neuropathy with IVIG? And IVIG is antibodies from other people. Um, it's what we get when people donate plasma. And it's used for a wide variety of autoimmune diseases. And so we, the, the bottom line is we don't have any large studies, and so it's very difficult for us to know that. Um, the medication is also very expensive and, and often very difficult to get approved by the insurance companies. Having said that, if there's evidence that a person has damage to their immune system and they have damage to their small nerve fibers, in my opinion, IVIG is a very reasonable thing to consider. And so here again, just a, a bunch of studies that have already been published by other people. Um, so here is a study looking at patients with sarcoid um, who have small fiber neuropathy who respond and improve with IVIG. Again, still making the point we need larger studies. Um, here's a study, uh, and, and we've done some work um, looking at Sjogren's syndrome. Um, and the argument is at least 20% of patients with Sjogren's syndrome have small fiber neuropathy. Um, and this, this talks about a patient who had severe burning who responded uh, to IVIG. Um, these are patients that actually had um, celiac disease and small fiber neuropathy, and they respond to IVIG. Um, these are those specific autoantibodies that patients can have that damage their nerves Again, need, which would almost never be tested if you didn't know that somebody had small fiber neuropathy. This was published out of the Mayo Clinic five years ago and showed that these patients responded um, not only in terms of their small fiber neuropathy, but really interestingly in terms of their autonomic neuropathy as well. And again, another study, uh, I think this is also, yeah, this is also out of the Mayo Clinic. Um, uh, which patients with those say a different type of antibodies against their small nerves um, can improve with IVIG. This was a paper that my partner and I published uh, a few years back um, looking at patients with Sjogren's syndrome as well as other autoimmune forms of small fiber neuropathy who had pain. Um, and if you just look, for example, at the second patient, um, you can see that they had no nerves um, in their, at their calf in their skin. They were treated with IVIG. Uh, their pain improved, and six months later, the nerves in their calf had grown back to normal. Um, and so, again, it, in my mind, if we don't evaluate patients aggressively, um, we're going to miss the patients that can improve. Now, again, it is not all patients that have small fiber neuropathy that we can reverse. But there are many patients with small fiber neuropathy that we can reverse. But unless we make the diagnosis and unless we figure out the cause, we can't treat them. And so to me, it's just, it, it's just not adequate enough to say a patient has pain. So what do the skin biopsies tell us? Most importantly, they tell us that the small nerve fibers are affected and that that's probably the cause for their pain. Um, they tell us where the pain is. Um, and then they uh, direct us to look for underlying causes that we wouldn't normally find. Um, and that they hopefully lead to some type of specific treatment for the patients. Um, we're able to repeat the biopsies. Um, I just had a couple of patients the, yesterday actually where I treated them with IVIG for three to six months. We repeated the biopsy and I just had another one who went from zero nerves to to not normal, but to about half normal in a matter of six months. Um, and again, because the biopsies are so simple and really not painful, um, we can repeat these biopsies to see if our treatment is actually working. So again, it's difficult, and I, I, I've certainly heard your questions on, on the Facebook pages. Um, finding a doctor that, that understands this, um, that wants to be aggressive in terms of evaluating you can be difficult. Um, it tends to be neuromuscular neurologists, but there are pain doctors and other doc rheumatologists and other doctors that are starting to learn this, and this is just going to continue to grow, I can reassure you. 
Um, the, the National Neuropathy Association is very helpful. Um, they just did a webinar, I think, about a month ago talking about small fiber neuropathies. They have certified centers in about 20 different states. Um, we're, we're one of those centers, but, but typically those centers will, will be very familiar with this type of problem. Um, and then we've tried to set up a free service um, to put you in touch with doctors in your local area um, that we know of that hopefully can do the biopsies and, and hopefully head, help you get um, the right evaluation. So that's really all I have to say. Uh, I appreciate your time and um, hopefully it's been helpful and um, we'll try to stay in touch and if there's more information, which there will be over the next you know months to years, then um, I'll certainly uh, keep you guys informed. Thank you.